Blessed is our God, Trinity of love, and blessed is the dominion of our God, now and ever and to the ages of ages. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. We claim this time for the worship of God. May God gather us from the four corners of the earth, uniting us as one body in Christ as we lift our voices in praise. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. A light in the darkness can extinguish. Since we live as people of the light, in faith, hope and love, let us pray to the Lord. Into your communion, Lord, gather all creation. As we continue this pilgrimage of renewal and repentance, observing a holy Lent through self-examination, prayer, meditation on the scriptures, acts of mercy, fasting and dedication to the ways of justice and reconciliation, let us pray to the Lord. Into your communion, Lord, gather all creation. With the traditional custodians of this land, the Boon Wurrung and Wurundjeri peoples, and with all whose blood cries out from the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Into your communion, Lord, gather all creation. Joining our voices with the deep groans of creation, and with the cries of the men that rise, 
From a world in travail, aching for redemption, let us pray to the Lord. Into your communion, Lord, gather all creation. With all who suffer with Christ under the weight of the sin of the world, those subjected to injustice and deprivation, those seeking refuge, freedom and peace, and especially at this time, with people who suffer with any kind of addiction, let us pray to the Lord. Into your communion, Lord, gather all creation. With all who serve the earth and its inhabitants, with leaders, policy makers, activists, with workers, students, artists, and storytellers. And especially this week with Jen, in her work with the Afghan Development Organization and her Apartment Owners Corporation, also as she leads um, the Wayfinders Group. Let us pray to the Lord. Into your communion, Lord, gather all creation. With each one gathered here in prayer, with our absent sisters and brothers, with our neighbours at the Swedish Church in Turak, and with the whole of Christ's Church from the banks of the Birarong to the end of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Into your communion, Lord, gather all creation. With God's faithful servants of every time and place, who year by year, generation after generation, have prepared for the celebration of our immersion into the mysteries of Christ's death and resurrection by faithfully observing this season of Lent. And with all whose faithful witness to the truth and commitment to the ways of discipleship have brought violent persecution and a Christ-like sacrifice of liberty or life. With the apostles Peter and Paul, Justin Martyr, Agnes of Rome, Thomas Helwis, Maximilian Kolbe, and Esther John. Let us pray to the Lord. Into your communion, Lord, gather all creation. We do when they lawyer. Who we want her now? With them and the cloud of witnesses, plus people end up by who believe they then will get up again. Make we pray to God. Into your communion, Lord, gather all creation. Blessed are you, O God, of all creation, and blessed is the communion into which you gather us. Dry seeds of hope, thirst for living, life-giving rain. Hard heartlands yearn for a softening shower. The dust and smoke of the parched earth rise up with the prayers of your people. Send your Holy Spirit to call us by name and lead us home. Wearied by the heat of hostility, your son beats back the fires of hell and calls us to follow him on the road to life, on through the charred valley of despair. Send your Holy Spirit to call us by name and lead us home. Days shorten and clouds darken the horizon. Bleached skeleton trees warn of unspeakable death, and the crows keep a knowing eye on our journey. Send your Holy Spirit to call us by name and lead us home. 
El Señor dice, el ayuno que a mí me agrada consiste en esto, en que rompas las cadenas de la injusticia y desates los nudos que aprietan el yugo, en que dejes libres a los oprimidos, en que compartas tu pan con el hambriento y recibas en tu casa al pobre sin techo. Entonces brillará tu luz como el amanecer y tus heridas sanarán muy pronto. O oh God, you have searched us and you know us. All that we are is open to you. We confess that we are entangled in sin. In your mercy, heal us and set us free. When we avoid examining ourselves, but jump to examine our neighbours, Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. When we confess you among our, amongst your friends and deny you when your enemies close in. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. When we show great discipline in pursuit of worldly wealth, but invest neither energy or enthusiasm in the treasures of the Spirit. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. And we clamor for your crown, but refuse to shoulder your cross. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. When we build our comforts and pleasures on the sacrifice of others, instead of sacrificing our privileges to build a world that we that all can share. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. When we would rather crucify the prophets than unweave the web of injustice. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. When we demand instant results and scorn those who find value in waiting, in yearning, in suffering, even in dying. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. When we look for an easy gospel, a lot of cross and a less demanding say Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. Your thoughts are not our thoughts, merciful God. Neither are your ways our ways. Your ways lead to the wide open spaces of heaven, while left to our own devices, our ways veer off into the dead ends of hell. But we are here not to have our worst confirmed, but to have our best liberated. Forgive us what has gone wrong, restore us what is wasted, reveal in us what is good. And nourish us with better food than we could ever buy. Your word, your love, your inspiration, your daily bread for our life's journey. In the company of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Jesus Christ was handed over to death for us and raised to life for our justification. Therefore, in an everlasting covenant, God has promised that all who put their trust in Christ will by grace be considered righteous. To each and every one of you, I declare, your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. In our darkness there is no darkness with you, O Lord. The deepest night is clear as the day. In our darkness there is no darkness with you, O Lord. The deepest night is clear as the day. Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that we might walk in his footsteps. He did nothing wrong, no false word ever passed his lips. When they cursed him, he returned no curse. Tortured, he made no threats, but trusted the perfect judge. He carried our sins in his body to the cross that we might die to sin and live for justice. When he was wounded, we were healed. Sisters and brothers, no matter the bread we get, we still suppose following with him Baba God, Yan Osun. As it be so, make we get sense follow Baba God words. Make we careful, no good drop off for waiting to save us. Lord, to whom shall we go? Yours are the words of eternal life. Shanah,你的奥妙通过世世代代的人们用智慧显明。可在神圣之处记录在圣书里 Send your Holy Spirit upon us that is your word may take root in the secret places of our hearts and may our truth to your glory A reading from the book of Genesis Let us listen for the word of God One day when Abram was 99 years old the Lord turned up and spoke to him, saying, I am God Almighty. You are to live your life openly before me with absolute integrity. I will put in place an alliance between me and you, and under its terms, I will make sure you have a huge number of descendants. Abraham dropped in his tracks with his face to the ground as God continued to speak to him, saying, I myself am forging this alliance with you. I am promising that you will be the ancestor of a whole bunch of nations. You are not to be known by the name Abram anymore. From now on, your name will be Abraham, because it means the father of many, and that is what you will be. I will make everything go well for you, and your family will multiply rapidly. From among your offspring, whole nations and kings will emerge. I will put this alliance in place between me and you and all who are to come in your family line through all generations. This alliance will last forever, committing me to being God to you and to your descendants after you for all time. Your wife, Sarai, is in on this alliance too. However, her name is to change too. From now on, her name will be Sarah. I will see to it that things go well for her. And what's more, she and you will conceive a child together and she will give birth to a son. I will make many things go well for Sarah. And in time, nations and great rulers will trace their family line back to her. Hear the word of God. We have heard it in silence. 
for the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How can I repay the Lord for all God's benefits to me? How can I repay the Lord for all God's benefits to me? Give praise all who fear God, revere and honour the Lord. Children of Israel, people of Jacob, the Lord never scorns the afflicted, never looks away, but hears their cry. How can I repay the Lord for all God's benefits to me? I will sing of you in the great assembly. Make good my promise before your faithful. The poor shall eat all they want. Seekers of God shall give praise. May your hearts live forever. How can I repay the Lord for all God's benefits to me? People shall remember and turn. All races will bow to the Lord, who holds dominion over nations. The well-fed crowd kneel before God, all destined to die, bow low. How can I repay the Lord for all God's benefits to me? My soul lives for the Lord, my children will serve and proclaim God to the future, announcing to peoples yet unborn, God saves. How can I repay the Lord for all God's benefits to me? A reading from Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome. Let us listen for the word of God. When God promised Abraham that he and his descendants would inherit the earth, it was not because Abraham had earned it by following God's instructions to the letter. Indeed, it was a gift given when God put things right for Abraham in response to the trust he had shown. If it were possible to earn the rights to the earth by rigid compliance with the law, then basic values like trust and promise would be irrelevant. It would all become just another legal contract to be negotiated. Tie it all up in fine print and it will only end up serving as evidence against you. But where the relationship is conducted on the basis of trust, no one goes on the lookout for every possible breach. So instead of being a legal matter, the fulfilment of the promise is conditional only on people's willingness to put their trust in God. It is simply an expression of God's generosity, and that's why it is guaranteed to always be available to everyone. Whether you were raised in a culture where observing the religious law was the norm or whether you have simply stepped out and put your trust in God like Abraham did, the promise is open to you. After all, both groups can rightly trace their line back to Abraham. And the scriptures say that God promised to make him the father of many nations. When it looked like Abraham wouldn't ever become the father of anyone, he trusted his future into the hands of God, believing that the God who can bring life out of death could create something out of nothing. He hung on to his hope, even when it seemed utterly hopeless. 
he kept on believing that he would have many descendants because he was sure that God had promised him that. Even the cold, hard biological facts didn't cause him to throw in the towel. He knew that his hundred-year-old body was past it and that Sarah was an old woman who hadn't even been fertile when she was young. Yet he didn't allow even such obvious obstacles to break down his trust and make him cynical about God's promise. Instead, his faith actually grew stronger as he went on, went right on crowing about the greatness of God. He remained dead set certain that God was more than capable of making good on the promise. That is why God counted his trust as the equivalent of a perfect life. Now, when the scriptures say it was counted as the equivalent of a perfect life, it is not speaking of a special arrangement for Abraham alone. No, it refers to all of us. We will all be accepted on that same basis if we too put our trust in the one who raised Jesus our Lord to new life from the dead. Jesus was put to death, even though it was us who had done the wrong thing. But he was raised to new life so that we could be put right with God. Hear the word of God. We have heard the silent. For the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. People of God. Let us acclaim God's saving justice, attested by the law and the prophets, and now revealed through faith in Jesus Christ to, to all who believe. Lord, to whom shall we go? Yours are the words of eternal life. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Once his followers had identified him as the Messiah, Jesus began to fill them in on what was going to happen to him. The new human is going to be put through the ringer. He'll be done over by the politicians, the priests and the religious lawyers. They'll have him executed but after three days he'll rise to life. He didn't beat about the bush on this. He spelt it out as clear as you like, but Peter would have none of it. He pulled Jesus aside and gave him a piece of his mind. Recognising that his followers were losing the plot, Jesus made an example of Peter, saying, Get out of my face, you Satan. You've got no idea what God is on about. You're just pursuing the same things as everyone else. Then he called everyone to gather round, his followers and the whole crowd, and he said to them, Anyone who intends to come with me has to hand over the keys, sign their own death warrant, and then do as I do. If you try to hold on to control of your life, you'll end up losing the lot. But if you let go... Even if you pay the ultimate price for your commitment to me and to our message, you'll gain real life. What's the point of getting control of the whole world if getting it kills you? There's no trade-in on a burned-out soul. There are some who find it embarrassing to be associated with me and with what I'm on about when they're hanging around with their deceitful and easily distracted peers. If they don't sort themselves out, they'll find that when the new human arrives, full of the glory of God and surrounded by the angels, he'll be too embarrassed to associate with them. 
This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. We hear the word of God proclaimed, but chaos and clamour compete for our attention. I close my ears to confusion. I close my eyes to enticements. I close my heart to temptations. Purge our delusions, O Christ, and let all turmoil cease within us. Engulf me in your passion. Embrace me in your darkness. Enclose me in your silence. Calm me, my Saviour, as you still the storm. Comfort me, my Redeemer. Keep me from destruction. Immerse me, Lord Christ, in the depths of your silence. At our Lenten retreat day last Sunday, we spent some time reflecting on a passage from the 15th chapter of John's Gospel that included Jesus saying, I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. One of the things that was said as we shared our reflections was that we found it difficult to understand or relate to that statement because none of us were experiencing ourselves as being hated or persecuted. Some Christians respond to this by trying to provoke hostility. They try to push their faith on others in such arrogant and disrespectful ways that people inevitably start hating them and then they congratulate themselves for living up to those words. Others respond by redefining persecution and they begin to imagine that they are being persecuted if people disagree with them or treat their faith as a bit of a joke or no longer regard Christianity as deserving a special privileged voice in our society. These things are not even remotely like the persecutions the early church was talking about. Jesus' words in tonight's gospel reading raise very similar questions. 
Once again, he describes himself as inevitably being subjected to hatred, rejection, persecution, and even being killed. And then he goes on to say that any of us who wish to be his followers must be ready to face the same. If any want to be, become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Taking up your cross did not and does not mean wearing a decorative cross-shaped piece of jewellery around your neck, nor does it mean stoically enduring some ordinary difficulty that comes your way. The people to whom Jesus addressed these words were familiar with seeing people literally taking up their crosses and being crucified. Crucifixion was a gruesome execution that the Roman occupation forces used, reserving it usually for those who were convicted of political or revolutionary crimes. Stand up against the empire, and this was how they made an example of you. It was gruesome and barbaric, and in that culture, Jesus' words could have no other meaning to his hearers than be prepared to cop that. So what does that mean for us when most of us are not copying any significant hatred or persecution and are not in any likely danger of being executed or murdered on account of being followers of Jesus? Has the world really changed that much? Or have we sold out and gone all wishy-washy and blandly inoffensive? I've been pondering this question more since last Sunday's retreat, because I'm certainly one of those who is not experiencing rejection and persecution. As I've pondered, I've realised something that seems to make this lack of hostile opposition even more surprising, and that is that we seem to be living in a time of increasing polarisation and rage. More and more, it seems like everybody is forced to take sides see everything in simplistic black and white terms, allow no hint of nuance or uncertainty, and be very hostile to those who don't take the same side. We saw this happening in Australia with the same-sex marriage debate. One of my friends, who had been a prominent gay rights activist in the 70s and 80s, had always seen marriage as an oppressive heteronormative construct that the gay community shouldn't want anything to do with. But by the time we got to the fractious debate in 2017, he said that it was no longer socially permissible to be anything other than for or against. And if he remained against, he was seen in his own community as being anti-gay. We saw it again disastrously in the recent referendum on an Indigenous voice to Parliament, more and more divisive. And the so-called progressive no case was routinely dismissed as all nuance was purged from the arguments and it just became for or against, with both sides disparaging one another. We can see it in the USA, where politics and political identity have become so polarised that neither side can even seem to recognise the basic humanity and right to exist of those on the other side. The foundations of democracy are crumbling because democracy has always depended on the losing side's capacity to accept being governed by the winners, and that is falling apart. Donald Trump didn't cause this either. He's just shamelessly exploiting it as it emerges. And we're seeing it also all over the world in the responses to the Israeli attacks on Gaza after the Hamas attacks on Israel. If ever there was a situation where right and wrong were more obviously shared by both sides, I don't know what it was, and yet most of the public discourse appears to proceed on the assumption that we all have to take sides and unquestioningly back our side, no matter what they do. Many Christians seem to not only buy into this idea that you have to be all in for one side, but also seem to take it for granted that Israel has to be their side. I suppose this is understandable since our faith formation is so shaped by scriptures that emerged from the land of Israel. 
Many of us have spent decades reading and praying these scriptures and interpreting the references to Israel as references to us. So we kind of identify with Israel as though it were our tribe. And for some Christians, this even goes a step further in a weird kind of prophecy thing, where although they probably wouldn't say it this way, the underlying assumption seems to be that biblical prophecy was not entirely fulfilled in Jesus, but is fulfilled in Jesus and in the reestablishment of the nation state of Israel in 1948. And so that sense of close association of our faith with Israel makes it hard to acknowledge that Israel can do wrong. So many of our founding stories cast Israel as the victim of atrocities committed by other world powers, that it's hard to contemplate the possibility that Israel might currently be a powerful perpetrator. But my point here is, whatever the balance of rights and wrongs might be on this issue, it is another issue that is fracturing our social division and causing waves of hostility and division, the likes of which we haven't often seen in this country. And all those examples of increasing social polarisation, and of course I could list many more, all of them tell us that if we Christians are not experiencing hostility or persecution, it's not because the world has become so harmonious and cohesive and tolerant of difference that such divisions never happen anymore. Much more likely then, it is because we are not actually perceived as different in any significant way, in any way that makes anyone feel threatened or uncomfortable. Now, of course, if being hated and persecuted was the name of the game, a goal in itself, then we could easily get people offside by being rude, disrespectful, arrogant and unpleasant. And as I said, there are some Christians who seem to take that approach in order to reassure themselves that they're being persecuted like Jesus. But being persecuted is not the name of the game. It is not the end goal. Jesus said that his followers are to be known for their love, their love of one another, their love of their neighbours, even their love of their enemies who hate and persecute them. And that, of course, is what we see in Jesus. So as I continued to, to ponder that at last Sunday's retreat and on into the week, I got to asking myself, what it was about the love and mercy that Jesus showed that resulted not in love being reciprocated, but in hostility and even violence. And what was it, of whatever that was, that I'm not showing to any significant extent and which therefore leaves me living without ruffling too many feathers? As I pondered that, I realized that the big thing was that Jesus was repeatedly seen to be loving the wrong people. He loved those who others thought should be shunned and rejected, because to do otherwise would encourage them and lead to them polluting and corrupting all that we hold dear in our society. To do otherwise would be to break down our sense of who we are and what we stand for. The obvious example here is that Jesus was frequently criticised and condemned for his positive, generous relationships with prostitutes and sinners. These were people whose values and behaviour were regarded as beyond the pale by the good, respectable pillar of the community types. Jesus didn't encourage their hurtful or self-destructive behaviours, but he did ensure that these people felt loved, accepted, and protected in his presence. A few decades ago, when I was working at the House of Hope in St Kilda, I did have quite a few friends who were prostitutes and petty criminals and substance abusers. There were prostitutes and petty criminals on the guest list of Margie's and my wedding. But I don't think anyone hated us for that the way they did with Jesus. Why not? I asked myself. Well, here's the thing. I was being paid to have good relationships with those people. It was categorised as charity, as a special ministry. 
even if I hadn't been being paid, it probably would have been seen as some kind of admirable voluntary ministry, still a form of charity. I don't think anyone ever thought that these were the people who I'd be hanging out with much of the time if I hadn't been involved in that ministry. And I know in my heart that it's true. From the way people responded to Jesus, it seems safe to conclude that he didn't make them feel like simply the objects of his charitable ministry. If he had, that probably wouldn't have caused any trouble because Israel had always seen charity and almsgiving as an admirable religious duty. The problem was that Jesus treated the prostitutes and sinners as though they were the equals of the decent religious people. And that got the decent religious people seriously offended. There was another way that Jesus was seen to be loving the wrong people too. I noticed this one when I began thinking about the times when Jesus aroused instant hostility. The obvious one was his first sermon in his hometown in Nazareth, when by the time he had finished, the congregation had morphed into an angry mob that tried to drag him out and throw him off a cliff. When you look closely at what he was saying, you realise that once again, he is saying that those who we regard as not like us are in fact equal to us and just as loved by God as us and equally to be loved by us. Jesus refers to two specific places as having experienced some blessing of God. And those places were both outside of Israel, in Lebanon and in Syria. He was saying that the God who regarded, who we regarded as the God of Israel was just as likely to bless and work through Lebanese people and Syrian people. Or think of his parable on another occasion about the good Samaritan. Samaria is the name that many Zionist Israelis still use for part of the occupied Palestinian territory in the West Bank. The hostility between Israelis and the Palestinians of Samaria goes back even further than the time of Jesus. But here was Jesus speaking to an Israeli congregation holding up a Palestinian man as the God-given model of neighbourly love that God is calling us all to emulate. The image of God is seen in this man who you fear as a potential terrorist, he says. It's seen in him every bit as clearly and in his actions here perhaps more clearly as in those you regard as the chosen people of God. It's often difficult for us in Australia <clears throat> to imagine ourselves into the intense feelings of tribalism that, make, that made that so shocking to his hearers, because we don't usually see ourselves as having clear natural enemies in that way. We don't think of ourselves as being such a defined group over and against others. And in reality, this is often just because we live in comfortable bubbles from inside of which we barely even aware of the existence of those we regard as dangerously unlike us. But we're certainly not immune. If you've not experienced it, try this little experiment. The next time you hear someone talking about the importance of buying Australian-made products, ask them why jobs for Australian workers are any more important than jobs for Chinese workers and see what sort of reaction you get. In fact, you'll probably balk at even saying it because you know exactly what kind of reaction you'll get. Xenophobic Australian tribalism is never that far beneath the surface. The kind of love that provokes the kind of hostility that Jesus copped is the kind of love that threatens our identities that are built on solidarity with our own in-group. It's the kind of love that says loudly and unapologetically that those people who we have defined ourselves as different from, better than, are every bit as valuable and loved by God and to be loved by us as we are. When I'm honest with myself, 
I know that I only rarely exhibit anything like this sort of tribe-defying love. And those of us on the progressive left end of the spectrum are usually no better at this than those of us on the conservative right end of the spectrum. Whatever our ideology, we tend to mainly spend our time in the company of those who share our views and our values. We think that we are better and closer to God than them. And if Jesus came along and began treating them as our equals, showing no preference for us over them, we'd be mighty offended. We might even be at risk of becoming the hostile mob, thinking he was a traitor who needed to be got rid of. And notice something else about the persecution Jesus faced, something that those who seek to provoke persecution for its own sake usually overlook. The persecution Jesus faced came mostly from his own people. Christians today who make a big deal about persecution are mostly always seeing themselves as persecuted by non-Christians. And sure, the persecution of Christians by the ancient Romans happened, but not on any significant scale until a century or so after Jesus. Jesus was persecuted by his own people, by those who shared his religious identity, the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. Precisely because he said that our religious identity doesn't make us any better than others. God's love is just as real for those who reject everything we stand for, for the feared and despised others. So as we journey through Lent, through this season of self-examination and repentance, let us seek to open ourselves to the shockingly radical love and mercy of God and allow ourselves to be opened up by that love and mercy to those who our tribes and our families and our social conditioning have shaped us to disregard and distance ourselves from. And let us learn to expand our love and mercy out to places and peoples that will probably get us into trouble with those who we are used to being accepted and affirmed by. Let us take up our own crosses. For it is that kind of love and mercy, in that kind of love and mercy, that we will find ourselves with our feet firmly planted in the footsteps of Jesus on his journey to the cross and to the wide open spaces of resurrection life that lie beyond the cross. Let us now affirm the faith of the church. We believe in God, creator of all that is and shall be, Redeemer of all that is less than it could be, sustainer of our living, our loving, our being. We believe in the cross of Christ, drenched in hatred and cruelty, yet overflowing with God's unquenchable love. We believe in the bread of life, broken and shared, it opens our eyes to the presence of Christ and strengthens us for the journey. We believe in the pain suffered by Christ, all our hurts, torments and betrayals, magnified in the purity of love and embraced that we might be free. We believe in joy of the Holy Spirit, poured into the hearts of those who with courage and resolve refuse to trade integrity for popularity. We believe in the gospel, good news offered to us in Jesus, despised by the world, but leading us in the way of life. We believe in love, the nature of God, a gift unsurpassed, but a mystery only fulfilled when everything else is relinquished. We believe in light shining from darkness, in mercy vanquishing bitterness, in life bursting free where death reigned. How then shall we live? How shall this faith take flesh in the world? The cross? We will take it. The bread? We will break it. 
The pain? We will bear it. The joy? We will share it. The gospel? We will live it. The love? We will give it. The light? We will cherish it. The darkness? God shall perish it.让我们坚定我们所承认的信仰，因为我们有一位大祭司，他已经升入神的高天尊荣，就是神的儿子耶稣基督。That we may remain humble in our preparation. For the blessings of the Paschal celebration, let us pray to the Lord. That this preparation for the Feast of Christ. Resurrection may change our hearts, empowering us to love even the least. Let us pray to the Lord. that we may treasure the words spoken into our hearts, learning and understanding to live it out. Let us pray to the Lord. That we may learn to know Jesus who came to save all who are gripped by greed and fear. Let us pray to the Lord. That we may face our sin in truth and humility. Let us pray to the Lord. That we might turn from evil and embrace the good. Let us pray to the Lord. That the world might be healed of its grievous wounds, that wars would cease, poverty, corruption and bigotry be eradicated and fear, disease, and despair be overcome. Let us pray to the Lord. that vulnerable and undeveloped nations might receive the aid and expertise they need to survive both old dangers and new and emerge strong, healthy and free. Let us pray to the Lord. <laughs> Oh.
that those whose family and families and communities that have been torn apart by acts of war, whether legal or criminal, might find justice, peace and healing. Let us pray to the Lord. that we might honour the First Nations of this land, seeking justice and reconciliation together, and taking to heart their wisdom for how to live in this land with respect and sensitivity. Let us pray to the Lord. that the most vulnerable in our society, including those without secure housing or work, those suffering illness, trauma or disability, and those seeking asylum on our shores, might be given welcome, support and hope. Let us pray to the Lord. That all whom we carry in our hearts, from around our world, around our nation and among our loved ones, might be gathered into our prayers. Let us lift up to God the names of those for whom we would especially seek God's care. that we might may pray as our Saviour prays. Let us pray the prayer he taught us. Our Father in heaven, how be your name. Our Father in heaven, how be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. On earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. As we forgive those who sin against us. As we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. Save us from the time of trial. And deliver us from evil. Deliver us from evil, Lord God. For we put our trust in your promise that the ancient deceiver of your people would be vanquished on the cross of your son. And so we ask you, Crush the power of demonic lies in the hearts of your people. Protect us from the sin that so easily entangles. Free us to run with perseverance the race you have set before us, looking only to Jesus as the origin and goal of our faith. Enfold all your people in mercy, Lord God, and strengthen us for the journey ahead. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever.
we stand at the threshold of the ultimate feast, when all hunger will be fed, and the new wine of justice will be poured. But even now, Christ invites us to his table to taste the first fruits and be nourished for the journey. Whosoever will may come, not because you are worthy, nor because any church gives permission, but simply because Jesus offers himself to you, and you want to offer yourself in return. Come, let us prepare the Lord's table, offering the gifts that we are and the gifts that we bring. Béni sois-tu, Seigneur, Dieu de toute la création. Par ta bonté, nous sommes en communion les uns avec les autres et avec tous ceux qui espèrent en Jésus-Christ. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Sing爱的神,全世界的地造者,生命之水的河流从你流出。We are the body of Christ. His spirit is with us. Let us lift up our heart. We lift them to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right to give you our thanks and praise, O God, for in an everlasting covenant, you have promised us to be our God through all generations. Yeah. You called into existence things that did not exist, the universe and all that inhabits it. From Abraham and Sarah you brought forth nations, calling them to walk before you in the righteousness that comes from faith. In your child, Jesus, you showed your compassion for the afflicted and taught us that real life is found by those who lose their life for your sake and for your gospel. He was rejected by the religious leaders and killed, but three days later you raise him from the dead as the Lord. Now you justify all who put their faith in you through him, counting to, it to us as righteousness and promising us the full riches of your grace when Christ comes in glory. Therefore, with the whole realm of nature around us, with earth, sea and sky. We sing to you. Avec les anges et les archanges qui nous enveloppent, avec tous les saints devant nous et près de nous, avec les frères et sœurs, à l'est et à l'ouest, au nord et au sud. We sing to you. Rahamra piya janhaka saar, avahami bata lok jo. We sing the hymn of an empty praise. Holy, 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 God of truth and God of truth and heaven and earth, the full of your glory, your glory. We 
We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Blessed are you, gracious Lord, and blessed is your dear Son, Jesus Christ, who feeds us with his own flesh and blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Consuming him and consumed by him, we are thus strengthened to walk in his footsteps, even knowing that to do so will inflame the fury of hell. We bless you for Christ, who has gone on before us, enduring the cross and disregarding its shame to open a new trail for all to follow, a trail of justice and liberating peace, which presses on through suffering and beyond, all the way to the banqueting room of heaven. Blessed is our brother Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith who, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, gave thanks, broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it to remember me. So as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, has died, is risen, is risen with a glorious glory. So, in this place, we celebrate the death of the dead, the life of the dead, the life of the dead. 耶稣基督分享的生命，世世代代在他的名中传播。现在与我们分享。Habiendo sido hechos uno con él y por tanto entre nosotros mismos, ponemos ante su presencia estos regalos de pan y vino, como señal de nuestro sacrificio de alabanza y de agradecimiento. Pues aquí nos presentamos a nosotros mismos, así como nuestros cuerpos, mente y espíritu. Para constituir un sacrificio continuo y santo para ti, Señor. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come and brood over these bodily things, this bread and this wine. May they be for us the body and blood of Christ, healing, renewing, and making us whole. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come and embrace us with your life-giving power, that as bread and wine are made one with us. We may become one with you, bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come and make of your gathered people the real presence of Christ for the world. Living our prayer and praying our life till earth and heaven are reconciled and all are free as Christ is free. Glory be to you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God and Mother of all creation. Look, 
the body of Christ given for the life of the world. Holy things for holy people. Holy one is holy, holy one is holy Jesus Christ. In him and him and him and him all things are made holy. To the glory and praise of God. To the glory and praise of God. Let us receive what we are. Let us become what we receive, the, the body, body of Christ. Christ. Jesus, the wellspring of life, invites all who are thirsty to come to him. So come, receive freely. Let us raise our cups as one and taste the first fruits of the coming joy. The blood of Christ keep you in eternal life until he comes. You take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. Lord Christ, you have called us to follow wherever the road of discipleship leads. In baptism, you secured our destiny, and in bread and wine, you feed us for the journey. Go before us now on the narrow way that leads to life. When the marketers offer everything, if only we have the money. And you offer everything, if only we will do without. I will take up my cross and follow you. When the easier way to succeed means we lose our integrity, but the harder way means we lose our pride. I will take up my cross and follow you. When the church wants us to conform and be nice, and you want us to rebel and be real. I will take up my cross and follow you. When our friends don't respect what we count as important, and we feel like giving in to save face. I will take up my cross and follow you. When friendships are easy and light, without commitment or vulnerability. And learning to love one another deeply means stretching far beyond the bounds of comfort. I will take up my cross and follow you, glorious and blessed God, creator, redeemer and sustainer. Wherever you go and wherever you lead, I will follow in faith and hope, relying for strength on you alone. Amen. None of us has the strength alone to live the prayer we have prayed, but with the Holy Spirit to unify and empower us, 
we can grow into our prayer. The Lord says, if you want to follow me, take up your cross and follow me. If you want to save your own life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for me and for the gospel, you will gain it. I assure you, there are some here who will not die until, until they see the kingdom of God. Go now and live before God in openness and integrity. Set your mind on the ways of God, not clinging to your own life, but taking up your cross and following Jesus. And may God give you a share in the eternal covenant. May Christ Jesus be proud of you when he comes in glory. And may the Holy Spirit make you grow strong in faith and lead you in the ways of righteousness. Friends, the Eucharist never ends. It must be lived. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen.